All right, hi everybody. I'm gonna get started. Um, my name is Sonia Huber. I'm the director of the MFA program. Um, and I've also had the distinct pleasure of uh, working with all of these wonderful human beings who I'll introduce in a second. I just wanted to take a few minutes first to thank you all for coming um, and to let you know that not only is creative writing a fun class to take here, whether you're taking poetry, fiction, or nonfiction, but contrary to many people's first assumption, it actually gives you skills that are directly helpful in getting jobs in publishing. So that's one of the things that some of our panelists are gonna talk about tonight. Um, on your way out, you can grab some of these little cards. They just have email addresses for myself and my colleague, Carol Ann Davis, who teaches the poetry workshops, among many other classes. Um, and these are great opportunities where you bring in your own writing into a, a setting, a small supportive setting, and in looking at the work of others, you're actually gaining an amazing amount of skill in learning how to edit and critique. Um, so in addition to that, these folks are gonna talk about other things that they did while they were here at Fairfield, and then afterwards to prepare themselves um, to transition into various roles in the publishing industry. Um, wanted to also mention out there on the, the table as you're leaving, there's a brochure for the Fairfield MFA program which is a Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. Um, actually, two of our folks are alums of that program. Um, and uh, it's the next level up in creative writing. The program is low residency, which means that you can work full time while you're in the program. And um, it allows you to both hone your own writing skill and figure out how you want to orient yourself towards next steps. So basically the way we're gonna work is we're just gonna go down and folks are each gonna tell their story. So we have Danielle Tulo, and they're each gonna sort of say more about what you, when they graduated and so on. And we have Lone Lee, we have Molly Gregory, Sam Palazzi, and Colin Hostin. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to them. After they've done speaking, we'll take uh, questions from all of you. And then once we've uh, sort of uh, had a good period of that, then we'll have more informal chatting and you can kind of approach panelists individually. So with that, we are so thrilled that you came tonight to share your experience with uh, current Fairfield students. Thank you so much. Danielle. Hi guys, I'm Danielle Tulo. I graduated in 2015. I was an English major with a concentration in creative writing. Um, when I was at Fairfield, I co-founded Her Campus Fairfield, which exists today. We have some Her Campus girls up here, and it's a website, a digital media experience. It gave me, you know, everything I need to know about starting a website. You know, Google Analytics, traffic, what's trending, using social media to get traffic, all of that. And I realized I definitely wanted to go the digital media route. So. Um, that really kind of fast-tracked me. I devoted all of my time into it while I was at Fairfield. I worked with so many amazing people and getting really cool stories up. And then I started at Cosmopolitan. Um, I interned there going into my senior year. And then I um, was obsessed with it. I was like, this is where I need to work. I need to work in a women's magazine. I love digital media. This is so great. So um, senior year, I really focused on impressing them while you know on campus. I think something so great about Fairfield is that you're so close to New York City. So I didn't want them to forget me. Um, I would take the train in and I would say, like, I had a meeting in New York today. Like, I'd love to stop by, but really, like, I was just stalking them. Like, I just, I did not want them to forget me. And I'd just show up and, like, bring some new clips, have some things to talk to them about, be like, I saw you publish the story. I loved it, blah, blah, blah. Slip them some of my latest things. You know, keep the, the network and the relationship going. Um, and it worked. I ended up becoming their social media editor um, February of my senior year here. So I was doing, taking all my classes. I think it was the craziest semester. I was taking like six classes, doing her campus, working for Cosmo. And I, I like, it was the best semester ever. I was like dean's list, like great grades. Like, I don't know how, but it was amazing. Um, and so, I was able to start working there ahead of graduation. Um, and then I, um, right, right, literally like the day before I graduated, I got offered the editorial assistant role there. So I was able to phase out of the social media editor role. Um, a, a common question I get about that is, you know, I went from being a social media editor to an assist, editorial assistant. 
Um, that doesn't sound as fancy. You know, I went from being an editor to an editorial assistant, which is like, you know, an assistant. It's entry level. Um, but being an EA is the best thing in the entire world. Don't shy away from it. I got to be the right hand to the editor who was Amy O'Dell at the time. And she I, taught me everything about the industry. And you really get access to, you know, the most important people at the company being an assistant and kind of learning everything that you need to know to then make your move your way up. So um, I was an EA for a year and a half, and then I got promoted to associate lifestyle editor, um, where I started the magazine's food section, which is Cosmo Bites. Um, and then I got promoted to Snapchat editor, so I ran their um, Snapchat Di Discover, which is still there today, um, which was really cool and really, really weird, explaining to your parents and your grandparents that you are the editor of a Snapchat Discover channel. It's quite interesting. So um, very, very heavy in digital media. I love digital media. I love the analytics. I love seeing what people are responding to. And so I was really able to do that with her campus Fairfield because that's what it was. Um, and so did all of that, and then I was at House Beautiful, which is within Hearst, um, for about six months. I spent four years at Hearst total. I was the senior lifestyle editor there. And then I started at her campus back in January as their deputy editor. So I spent four years at Hearst. It was amazing, learned so many things. And then I kind of like went full circle back home to her campus media, which is based in Boston, but I'm in New York City. I have a team there that I'm building, which is really exciting, um, and kind of getting to just everything that I learned working for a big corporation, applying it into a small women's media company. And it's, it's really exciting. So that's my like five minute summary of my life. I don't know, how'd I do? <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Lone Lee and um, I'm an associate editor at HRA Books, which is an imprint at Simon & Schuster. Um, so I graduated in 2014 and um, on campus I was a part of the mirror right from the start, um, from freshman year to senior year. I started as a contributing editor and then Vine um, director and then worked my way up to the EIC or um, editor in chief. And um, I think half of my career at Fairfield, I had this belief that I was gonna go into journalism. Um, that was my actually my concentration. So I was English and concentrating in journalism. And I think with my first four years, I really did believe it. Um, I would spend <laughs> all my time on the mirror um, and I would just uh, write and edit. And I mean, the mirror is, if you are looking for a, ha ha um, a hands-on experience of editing and pressure and just, just everything that you would expect in a, um, later on in a, a digital media setting or publishing setting, I highly recommend the mirror. Um, nothing gets you more prepared to, to work on your feet than having the computers crash at like 1 a.m. and then losing everything in an issue. I don't know if there's any mirror pe people here, but okay, yeah, because you laughed, so you understood. Um, but um, so you definitely build the skills there of uh, also copy editing, design, um, just the actual, uh, the actual um, knowledge of knowing that you had put yourself into this physical copy of something. I think that's what I take with me to, to Simon & Schuster, where you know the books that you get from manuscript, um, you now see it as a book. So that's a really great um, feeling to see. Um, and then I was also, I mean, the second half of my career here, I um, got more serious about writing. I took fiction, um, fiction classes, all of them, and then I took um, publishing, which is, that, that was a really great experience as well. Um, and then I was part of Dogwood, as well as managing editor. Um, oh, sorry. Did you want to say a little bit more about what that was? Oh, Dogwood. Yeah, yeah Dogwood was um, the it was a type the practicum. So we would we would take editorial ship um, positions there, and we would read submissions. Um, we were we had a hand in designing the the cover as well. Um, but that definitely prepared me for reading. Um, obviously, in book publishing, you have to read, and you have to read really quickly. And I think that experience, during that time when I was working in Dogwood, we had a um, submittable contest where people would submit submissions, fiction, nonfiction. So you read a variety of that. And um, that really, uh, you know, just just being able to, to judge um, and also um, verbalize, you know, why this piece works or why it doesn't. Um, I definitely took that to Simon & Schuster as well. And Dogwood, I think that I, I heard that the literary magazine issue just came out or something, so. Oh, great, yeah, yeah, so it's really beautiful. I mean, this is another thing of, 
you know, uh, the Fairview Mirror had a mirror copy that you can hold. The Dogwood copy has something, the Dogwood um, journal has something you can hold as well. Um, so my first, yeah, so my first um, two years was about journalism, but then I wanted to go into uh, to an internship. I wasn't sure about newspaper um, or publishing because I always loved to read. Um, but then I forgot which department, but they forwarded like a link to Simon and Schuster, and I applied, and I, you know, did, had the sense of like, okay, people who are applying will have the same. Um, the same skills that I'm mentioning on my resume, so there's no point. But I did it anyways. I got an interview because, this is a great fact, um, because the HR person was a stag. So um, it was brilliant. Like, literally the email that she sent me was, the first one was saying, go stag. So I was like, okay, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so that was uh, the summer after my sophomore year, so uh, summer before junior year. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to because of Fairfield and because of the magic scholarship that they gave me, I was able to, they were able to um, support me as I was living in New York and working as an editorial assistant at Touchstone, which um, it no longer exists now, but um, some of the editors who I worked with in 2012, they're still, I work with them now. Um, not directly, but they're my colleagues. Um, so that experience was life-changing and it definitely shifted my attention from journalism to book publishing because um, just that direct energy of being in an editorial meeting, of listening to these editors who have years of experience talking about the submissions that they got, why is this so exciting? Like, they would talk about hot submissions, they would talk about celebrities and writing their memoirs. And I think that just really, when I sat in that board meeting, I was like, this is where I belong. Um, and they definitely trained me. You would think as an intern they would you know, send me out for coffee or um, have me copy stuff. But they were really having me read submissions, manuscripts, writing readers' reports, and telling them, you should buy this because XXX. Um, and then, so that, that experience was totally life-changing. And um, I kept in touch with some editorial assistants who I helped out at the time. And, um, I think I didn't, um, I didn't really like pay attention to how important networking was until I was in my senior year. I was, um, I was still editor in chief at the Mirror, but I was also lit um, interning at a literary agency called Folio, and that was also an experience itself of reading, reading manuscripts right before they're even touched by someone, um, and getting into the action of like, of actually pitching. Of, of pitching books to agents um, and authors, or, or agents and editors, so that was great. But during that time, because of the connection I had with Simon & Schuster when I was in my senior year, um, I had an editorial assistant who was now an assistant editor, so she moved up and stuff, and she actually said, oh, there's an opening. Um, I wanna bring you in for an interview with um, one of the directors. And um, that was my big, my first big girl interview, I think. And it was actually too early. It was, ha it happened in April instead of, you know, typically May or June. Um, so I went in knowing that if they did perhaps offer me a job, I wouldn't be able to take it because if that if that happened, like editorial assistant jobs get snatched up really quickly, so they would have to have you work um, like within two weeks and stuff. But um, because of my Simon Schuster connection, I was able to get this first experience of of interviewing. Um, but then, um, luckily, uh, right before graduation, um, my interview, I think I was taking Errol, um, Carol Ann's class, the portfolio class, where we had to, we, we basically submitted pages and pages of our own work, our fiction work, and I had my binder, I think, and I was, I was dropping it off at your door, and I was running because I had to catch the train to New York for my interview for Jen Bergstrom um, at Gallery Books. She was the, the publisher. Um, she is the publisher. Um, and I, yeah, I got the job the next day, I think. Um, and I started right after graduation, like a week after. Um, that was not the best choice. But I'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, working for Jen Bergstrom and, and working in this position as, my title was an editorial assistant, um, and I, um, I think I really echo your, what you said about editorial assistant jobs, like this is so important. 
you learn how the company operates, um, you get to observe people who have been at their craft for years and years. Um, so you get kind of like a better understanding of the larger picture, I think. So um, I spent two years as an editorial assistant, um, more of you know working on the business side and the company side of um, arranging um, meetings with authors and agents. And then I made a lateral move um, three years ago to Atria Books, where I am now as an editorial assistant. And I worked for two senior editors who acquired a very diverse lists, um, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, and then I recently was you know, promoted to, to, I grew up in Etra, basically. I grew up there, you know, editorial assistant and then assistant editor, and now I was recently promoted to associate editor. Um, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think it's really important to get involved now. Like, the experience is one where you, um, you're, you kind of, you're able to like make mistakes, I think, um, in a safe environment. Like hopefully you don't make a big mistake. But like you're able to make mistakes safely and learn from it. And then also you get to, get to connect to people. Um, uh, and, and you never know, they're gonna show up in your life later on. So, yeah. Let's see if this one works. Is this Yes, hello. Um, I'm Molly. I graduated in 2016, and I always felt like I was born to be in publishing. I came into Fairfield, an English major already declared. Um, I concentrated in creative writing, and later I tacked on another major in American Studies and a minor in digital journalism. But I knew that I wanted to do book publishing, and so happily, uh, I'm not sure how it works now, but there was like a creative writing track, and that was what I decided to do, and I decided right off the bat that I was going to take Publishing 101. So I took Publishing 101 with Carol Ann over here, and then Publishing uh, 2 with Sonia over here, um, and I got to work on Dogwood kind of from the earliest of stages, just like loaned it with reading submissions and talking about writing and what makes a good piece of writing and what doesn't to later down the line actually editing. Um, and if any of you are interested in getting into book publishing, I think it's an invaluable experience because editing isn't just reading something and saying, oh, this is great, or oh, this is bad. It's learning <laughs> how to work with an author and to talk to them and to have a conversation about their writing. And what about their writing can they improve? What parts of the book really need to come out? What things can you get rid of, and then you get down to the nitty gritty, which is grammar. Um, it was actually very helpful. We did real proofreading at Dogwood, so doing the actual markings up of a manuscript, which you might have done in elementary school and haven't done since. Um, but it's that's great. it's really helpful. You will use it in the industry. Um, and it was also great, too, because we got to use InDesign and going off of loan, actually designed the journal. So that was an invaluable experience, and I think it really helped me a lot. Um, and the other thing that Fairfield really prepared me for, um, I worked in the Writing Center, which Colin is involved with, and that's just another great experience to learn about how to work with somebody on writing. I think it's really, really easy to look at something and say that you don't like it, but it's another thing to actually work with somebody on developing a piece. Um, I always feel like writing is a, a team effort, um, and you and an author are on the same team, and you have to learn to work together. Um, so teamwork is key. Take some team building classes. It'll really help. Um, but yeah, so I did that my sophomore through end of junior year. I took, there were three publishing course offer at the time. I took the publishing practicum as well. Um, and then my senior year, I did an internship with Carol Ann at Cathedral Academy. Um, I ran eight weeks of poetry workshops uh, teaching elementary students and middle school students about writing, which was really, really fun. Um, but I knew that I wanted to be in New York after senior year, didn't know how I was gonna get there. So I was like, gonna go for a big internship. Um, 
So I applied to a bunch of places, and I applied to Cosmo, actually. And I think I messaged Danielle on LinkedIn, and I was like, hey, I don't know you, but I want to be at Cosmo. And she was on the digital side. Um, but I eventually got, in, got to Cosmo uh, the second half of senior year, which was very, very exciting. So I was going into the city three days a week, full days, on top of a full workload. So I'd get up at like 5 AM. I would take the train down. Um, and it was a, it was a real challenge. Um, I did not sleep very much senior year. But it, <laughs> it really, really paid off um, because I was really fortunate enough to not just be getting coffees. I was pitching story ideas. I was finding friends to interview for articles. Um, every day I put together, I had half an hour, me and two other interns, to put together a newsletter that went out to the entire Cosmo staff about what was going on that was really hot right now, from politics to pop culture to random fun facts. Um, and that actually was super helpful for where I ended up next. So the pieces kind of fell into place in this very magical way. Um, I did a couple of interviews with a couple of publishing houses. Nothing was really hitting. But then it was about two weeks before I was supposed to graduate. And I think both Carol Ann and Sonia emailed me. They were like, hey, an alum just reached out. And there's an opening at Gallery Books at Simon & Schuster. And that alum was Lone, actually. Um, the power of alumni. So I emailed Lone right away, and uh, I applied um, through HR. I had an interview. And I got a job like within a week. They loved her. They, they really loved her. <laughs> so I had eight days to move to New York between like graduating. It was wild. But uh, I ended up having a friend who had an open room in his apartment. And it, it all worked out, really. It was really serendipitous. Um, so now I've been at Gallery Books for three years, um, still an editorial assistant. But uh, I think something that's important to know about being an editorial assistant is that it's a very flexible title. And even though you are assisting to editors, you're doing everything from helping them read books to actually buying books um, and acquiring them to doing your own work. Um, so I was very lucky. And in kind of the first six months after I started, an editor left. Um, and there were a bunch of romance ebooks that needed attention. And so I, very eager, said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so <laughs> I edited everything from <laughs> cowboy military romances to <laughs> Uh, historical regencies, and it's it's a blast of a time. Um, and it was a great way to get started. Um, but I knew that I really wanted to go into nonfiction, which was actually my favorite thing that I worked on at Dogwood. I always wanted to edit nonfiction. Um, and what's really great about Gallery is that they really want assistants to be proactive. So a lot of times, we're going after celebrities or people who are trending to get books with them um, before they really hit. So uh, what's still the biggest highlight of my career is last May, or last March, excuse me, rather, we had a meeting and we were talking about what was trending um, in the world, and I mentioned Queer Eye. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, an executive editor at uh, Gallery, Jeremy Ruby Strauss, who's notorious for uh, taking assistants under his wing and helping them to grow, said, OK, if you want a book with Queer Eye, then let's make a book. So I went to Barnes & Noble that day, and I looked at all the different pop culture kind of nonfiction books that were coming out right now. And I was taking notes, and I was coming up with an idea. So in 24 hours, I turned around a 10-page proposal for the Queer Eye book. Um, you so did we, their work. So. I did their work, which goes to show. Uh, we brought it to their agent. The agent took it out wide, which means instead of just dealing with us, they sent it to all of the publishers in New York. And we ended up not getting it. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> WME. Oh, <my. laughs> um, so but from there, I said, well, let's still make something happen. So we looked at the team. 
And I thought, you know what would be great? Karamo Brown has had an amazing story. So let's go, let's go after Karamo. So we approached Karamo Brown's agent, which is at a different agency, and we said we would love to do a memoir with him. Um, and that ended up working out. So that was really, really an exciting process because uh, I worked very closely with him and a ghostwriter, which is oftentimes if you're working with a celebrity or somebody who has a really busy schedule, you'll work with another writer who's kind of the go-between, and they're the ones doing the actual writing. Um, but it ended up being a wild production schedule where we decided to ship dates around. Um, and I had one weekend to edit that book. Um, it was a roller coaster from start to finish. But uh, the book came out in March of this year. Um, and it was so cool to see that an idea that I had had became an actual tangible thing. And I think that that's something to sort of take with you, even if you're not going to be going after celebrities and developing books, if you are proactive and excited about something, I think what's really great about the publishing industry is that they really care what editorial assistants think. Um, they really want to hear your ideas because you're often going to know about things before the senior editor are going to. Um, and if you are eager and invested, you can really go far. Um, and you can do anything from romance to celebrity books. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was really frustrated. And it just happened. So I think, yeah, don't lose faith um, and just keep working hard and reach out to alums because I think that's really, you know, what's going to get you in. In Fairfield, people love Fairfield, so don't hesitate to ever, to ever reach out. I think that's super important. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm Sam Palazzi. I work at Scholastic as an editor for two imprints. Um, one is Chicken House and one is David Fickling Books. So these are two UK imprints. Um, Chicken House is run by Barry Cunningham, who is the person who discovered J.K. Rowling. So Scholastic partnered with him, and now I'm the one who directly acquires anything that he has. And same with David Fickling, who's the editor of The Curious Incident of The Dog in the Nighttime or The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Um, so it's really fun. They are two very eccentric and bizarre and hilarious and brilliant men. Um, and yeah, so it didn't happen as seamlessly for me as I think it did. It was, it was tough to get into this industry. Um, so I, I started here with no idea what I wanted to do, like none at all. I knew that I could draw. So I became a studio art minor, and I figured I'd fill in the dots from there. Um, and then I took your nonfiction class, and I was like, oh, I could, I could write things. So, um, and I remember one thing that you said was that it's good to make lists. So I started making lists, and I got a journal, and I started making lists. Um, and then I, from there, just signed up for every creative writing class because that was just fun for me. And I realized, like, aside from art, I could, this is a place where you can mix your passions, which is really, really incredible. Um, and actually, for my senior project, I put together a, a group of short stories. And I, for my studio art class, I took a, um, I did an internship at the Center for Book Arts, and I learned how to bind my own books. So then I just bound my own short stories and presented it to my class. And it was like really something that you could only do here. <laughs> you can really just invent your own major to, to a large degree. Um, but yeah, that was really a big moment for me where I realized that I wanted to work with words. I wanted to work with books. Whether I'm binding them or writing them or editing someone else's, I just want to work with books somehow. And then I graduated and became a lifeguard. So <laughs> it was not <laughs> as easy for me. But then I went to the dentist. And the dentist said, Sam, it's six months after graduating. What are you doing? And I was like, I'm, I'm a lifeguard. And they're like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, and then their fingers are in my mouth, too, so it was very hard to talk. Um, and he actually knew someone who worked at Scholastic. And he was like, I can put you in touch. 
So you can find connections anywhere. Just keep telling people what you want to do. Um, so I actually, the first job that I got at Scholastic was more in the, on the marketing side of things. Um, but it was still working with writing and working with kids and working for kids. And that was such a great feeling. And the good thing about that was I was able to keep writing. And I was able to keep taking classes. Um, and the reason I knew I wanted to keep writing, and I think one of the, like, the key like most influential thing that I did here at Fairfield was intern at the MFA program at Enders Island. And it was 10 days, it was a 10 day retreat where all you're doing is talking with people about writing, having them edit your own stories, editing other people's stories. Um, and just one you know, full circle moment is one of the mentors there was Da Chen who um, wrote Colors in the Mountains, the New York Times bestseller. And now Scholastic is publishing his book. So he walked through the halls one day and I was like, duh, do you remember me? Um, so really it's like connections wherever you can find them. Um, so anyway, back to the dentist. I had my, my interview with, with this woman. I got my foot in the door. Um, and I realized I still, I still wanted to work with the manuscripts. I wanted to work with authors. So I just kept applying. I applied to absolutely everything. I just, every, any connection I could find, I, I went and, and just made those. Um, and eventually I got this job. And it's an unconventional route. And it is hard, and I will echo the, the like, it is good to be an assistant and to have that um, really like hands-on experience from the ground up because you're learning all of those little things, whether it's like an internship or, an assistant role or, or something, like it was hard for me to jump in at that point and really just get your bearings for all of the minutia and all of the programs and all of the ways to deal with an author and the amount of submissions that you get and how much you're su supposed to read of each submission and there's so much. Um, so it was, it was a huge learning curve, but it was incredibly rewarding um, and now I work with authors like Cornelia Funke, who was the author of The Thief Lord, um, and Kevin Brooks, and Lucy Christopher, and Lucy Strange, and they're absolutely incredible. Um, but I will say that like none of it could have happened without Fairfield. It was, it was one of those places where you can decide what exactly you want to be and make the connections that you want from this place and just let yourself grow into whatever it is you decide you want. But you don't have to decide right away. If you just decide, I want to work with books, I want to work with authors, I want to work with manuscripts, just like, just make those connections in any way you can. And I will say one piece of advice that I have that I didn't do myself is get on Twitter. And really just, you don't have to, you don't have to actually get so involved. But if you start following places like if you want to be in publishing, like Publishers Weekly, Publishers Marketplace, um, and just seeing like what's being acquired every week. Like, there's a there's a rights report that comes out every week, and it says what editors like. You you can see what loan acquired. You can see what I acquired. Like, and and that's what agents do. They really scour those. Those, um, it, I mean, it's such a community of people that look at the same stuff constantly. Um, and if you really get yourself familiar with those trends and what's going on, um, you can really be that much more equipped in a conversation, in an interview, um, or even just more familiar with the people who are, who are being written about and who are writing those things. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that is what I have to say. And here's Colin. Hey. Uh, okay, so my name is Colin Hostin, and um, as Sonia said, I graduated from the MFA program here at Fairfield in 2014. Um, and um, uh, my path into publishing started before that, because I, I, I came here for grad school. Um, although I think one of the takeaways that I'm taking from just uh, this panel, and, and certainly my experience with the industry, is that there are so many paths into it. You know, it's, it's sometimes a difficult industry to break into, but as you've heard uh, today, there's a lot of different ways uh, uh, to break into it. Um, for me, um, yeah, I, I absolutely the advice about um, seeking internships and seeking experience um, uh, invaluable. Um, as an undergraduate, uh, after sophomore year, I had my first internship um, at a law firm in Atlanta because at the time, as an English major, my intention was to go to law school and become a lawyer. It was very unoriginal. 
Um, and it was um, extremely helpful because I hated it so much. Um, and this, uh, that was useful feedback. Um, certainly there were a lot of variables and perhaps that was just one particularly miserable firm. But, um, but nobody seemed happy who worked there. And I, wasn't, I didn't enjoy it. And, um, and so I, I decided uh, that was not going to be my future. Um, and so was lucky enough the following summer after junior year to get an internship um, at a, a small publishing firm in New York. Uh, it's called The New Press. It's a um, not-for-profit, relatively small, although they're, they're, they're pretty well known and growing. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. As an intern, as, as has been uh, said before, um, I did get a chance to just really uh, get my hands onto projects, learn as much as I wanted to. It was not a huge team, so I had access to pretty much anybody, you know, the publisher, the executive editors, you know. Um, they were very um, willing to, to share their expertise, very generous with, uh, with their experience. And that uh, solidified it for, uh, for me that I wanted to work in book publishing. And so uh, after senior year, um, or getting towards the end of it, I started to, uh, to apply. I knew I wanted to, I was living in Atlanta at the time, and I wanted to move to New York, where um, at the time, and I think still today, it, it really is the capital of book publishing. There's certainly opportunities to work in publishing outside of New York City, especially on the East Coast. Um, but I wanted to, you know, I was starstruck. I wanted to go live in New York for a little bit. Uh, and um, uh, to echo the theme of, of, of uh, networking and making connections. Uh, in my senior year, I got to go to a, a forum much like this, where one of the speakers was, at, at the time, the chairman of the board of a company called John Wiley & Sons, known mostly for textbooks, although they have a pretty large uh, trade um, book industry, meaning they, they sell books that you would see at any uh, regular bookstore. And um, this guy, Peter Wiley, was just a, a nice dude. He, you know, he stayed afterwards and talked to people, and I said to him, hey, I want to work in publishing, and he said, uh, here's my email. Uh, email me when you're when you're when you're close to being ready, and I and I did, um, and so um, uh, I got he, he and he was responsive, and I got uh, uh, in contact with some folks at the company. Um, spoke with uh, had my first interview, like a phone interview with someone at, at, at HR, and then um, I applied for an actual position. Had another another interview for that. Had a third interview for which I flew myself up to Hoboken, where they were located. And um, it, everything was going fantastic. So um, I graduated and decided I was going to get a job at John Wiley & Sons because it was just, they were just waiting for me to graduate and give, make me an offer. Um, I moved to New York, to Brooklyn, um, and uh, found out that they did um, offer the job to someone else. So I was in the city and I didn't have a job, and it was, um, uh, there were moments of anxiety. But like people have said, um, you know, I just, um, I, I sent my resume everywhere. I applied to everything I could. And, um, you know, I, and I also had some luck and some serendipity because a friend of mine um, knew somebody who was working in HR um, at a place called Hyperion Books for Children. And uh, he put me in contact with her and she said, have, have you considered working in children's books? And I, um, I lied and told her I had. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and I got the job. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I was working as an editorial assistant. Everything that they have said has, uh, is true. It's one part editorial, one part assistant, and you can make it, you can kind of make the balance, um, you know, something that works for you uh, at most companies. Um, and so, yeah, I just, uh, it was a great learning experience. I worked with children's books. I worked with um, some very smart editors. Uh, made some um, friendships that I still uh, cherish today. And uh, at the time, Hyperion um, was, it still is owned by the Walt Disney Company. Um, Disney and uh, several other companies were really trying to make inroads into the digital book market, the ebook market. This was around 2007 when um, that was, that phrase still meant nothing, <laughs> really. Um, and, um, but, you know, Disney, like a lot of the other companies, decided they wanted to try. And they created a digital book, uh, digital media department. And I transferred uh, into it. Uh, and so my role kind of changed. I was doing a little less editorial, um, actually more um, operations and marketing. Um, but again, great experience, great learning experience um, uh, for me and for the company. I mean, I think uh, Disney would admit that a lot of their first forays into digital books failed uh, because they really didn't. I mean, you know, the iPhone came out in 2008. Just think about that, right? 
there was a world before the iPhone. And so um, for, for many of those early years, most publishers were really just figuring it out, throwing spaghetti and seeing what stuck. And a lot of it didn't. And a lot of it still isn't. <laughs> um, we can talk about the ebook market, but um, anyway. Um, uh, things changed for me when uh, Disney relocated most of its uh, publishing operations to the West Coast, where they were like, yeah, that's where our, our company is. Why do, why do we need to be in New York? And I think more and more companies are finding it uh, something to think about in terms of relocating outside of New York City, where it's um, uh, a little more, more expensive, obviously, to have an office. Uh, anyway, uh, I did not move out with them. Uh, but I was lucky to stay on uh, in a um, sort of freelance role uh, in multiple capacities. I, I, I've, I've freelanced uh, as an editor at Disney, um, at Disney Press when one of the editors went on maternity leave. Um, I currently freelance as a writer because a lot of the work that they do um, is basically licensed publishing. It's not quite the same uh, trade operation that, um, uh, that may be done at other companies. So uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's them selling products. It's not a little less glamorous, but it's still a lot of fun for me. I get to work with properties that I grew up with, like um, uh, uh, the Avengers and um, a lot of the Pixar um, uh, properties. And of course, they just bought Star Wars, and they're, you know, they're just buying everything. So, um, And so uh, I continue to do that. Um, after they relocated to LA, I shifted gears a little bit. I came back to school. I did my MFA in creative writing here at, uh, at Fairfield. Um, and um, I've kind of t t continued to teach here at Fairfield since graduating. I, t I teach uh, in the first year writing program. I've also taught the World of Publishing uh, course. Uh, that I see some of my former students here. How are you doing? Um, and uh, through the MFA, I met a couple of uh, friends um, who, um, uh, together with me, formed a small writing group. And it was from that experience that I got into something that I'm still working on today, which is a what I call a publishing, publishing cooperative. Basically, we formed a small press uh, that's based right here in Connecticut. And um, it's been a, a really cool experience, because I think at this point now, I've seen um, and worked in publishing from almost every angle. Um, and you know, my impression is that it is an industry that is facing many, many challenges. It is not immune to some of the economic factors, the global economic factors that are affecting every single industry. Um, but that um, because of um, advances in technology and an advance in um, ways to reach different markets, there are probably more opportunities now uh, in publishing than existed when I got into, into it in 2004. So um, I think that it is something, if you're here, if you're interested, if you're curious, it's something that I would certainly recommend as a really fun, rewarding, enriching uh, career path. So, yeah. Well, I'll say a few things and then I'll take questions. Just wanted to, for those of you that are wondering how to get into things here at Fairfield, um, if you're not connected with creative writing yet, you know, as you're leaving, you can take one of those cards um, and then just email um, Professor Davis or I and, um, and tell us as soon as you can, this is what I'm interested in. Because once we know, then we can keep an eye out for uh, job opportunities like the one that we sent loan. And um, you know, we can steer you into the, right, into the right classes and paths. And the other thing I think is so interesting is, you know, we here sometimes think about journalism, English lit, and publishing, creative writing being all very separate, right? But I know in my own career, and probably for a lot of you, they are all, they meld really well together. And you can, it, this used to not even be the case at much, but I think now you can definitely transfer among all those fields. If you like to write, if you like writing and editing, you can end up doing a whole lot of different things. So with that, um, I'll take questions if anybody has questions. Um, how did you move, because you all said that you were able to just jump into the career world right after graduating, so how did you move out so fast? Oh, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 
It's a lot of work. Um, uh, it depends on, I guess, where you're moving and how much time you have. I spent senior week going to New York to look at random apartments um, with random people that owned them. It was a weird time for me. <laughs> um, but I think in terms of moving, if you have to move really quickly, it's, it's, again, the power of networking. I was posting on my Facebook status. I was, like, emailing people to be like, do you have anyone I can live with? <laughs> um, there are, you know, networking things that you can do on, like, Facebook. I used a site called Gypsy Housing, which is for, like, actors. Um, <laughs> but I still got on there. Um, and that's, like, where you can find open rooms. Because um, typically you will be in New York. But also just keep kind of in touch with people around you, because um, a lot of Fairfield people, if you end up moving to New York, there's going to be a lot of stags who are also moving to New York. So I think just kind of keeping in touch with people, and if there's like a class group posting in there, there's going to be a lot of people who are moving to the same city, whether or not it's New York. So yeah, I don't know if you want to add. I, well, um, so I, I mean, I moved right after um, college. Um, well, first I want to say, like, I mean, if you, your parents are willing, if they are, they don't hate you by then, um, you can, you, there's a lot of people who live at home first for a few months maybe to save money. There's nothing wrong with saving money because I swear you'll have to do that in publishing, in, in, in journalism. So don't be ashamed if your parents are okay with it, et cetera. But um, there's also, the, Craigslist is one of those you never know. Um, so you can consider that, but there's a roomie.com that is very safe, I think. That, I mean, I it, I didn't use it right after college, but when I was looking for a roommate recently, I used roomie, and, and, and it's very affordable, I think, too, because they're very realistic about prices. So there's a ton of apps, I think, out there um, that you can use. So I don't know if I misunderstood the question, but I'm going to talk about like how to actually get a job right when you graduate, or maybe like the process of yeah, moving and, and figuring it all out, but I both, okay, cool. So um, I think that a lot of it is honestly timing. Like I wish that I could be like, I was amazing, I worked really, really hard, and that's why the universe gave me a job the day after I graduated. That's not how it worked. Like I worked very, very hard, but timing was on my side. I spoke to everyone, kind of like everyone had said, talking to anyone who would listen about what I wanted to do, but also about making sure that I was listening about them, knowing their career, following editors on Twitter, keeping in touch, cold emailing. You know, using your network is amazing. Using, you know, alumni is incredible, but there's also a lot of people out there who would be willing to help you even if you didn't go to the same college. If you take the time to send them a cold email or if you send them a tweet message or anything like that. And so I think that's super, super important to do is just like, make people know you're interested and make sure that you, when you reach out, be like, I want to hear about you and what you're doing because it's really interesting to me. You know, don't just be like, I'm messaging you because I'm graduating next week and I would like a job. You know, like, start building that relationship early. If you're graduating this year, like, and even if you're not, start reaching out to people. Start those conversations really early. You have, you know, you're right by New York City. Take the train in. Ask someone to take them to coffee. Like, especially editorial assistants, because I networked so much with the editorial assistants at Cosmo, and then one of them got promoted and was like, I'm throwing your name in. Like, you are the person that needs this job, and that seems the same for you. And so editorial assistants are working so hard. If you email them and say, like, I would love to get coffee with you, I loved getting those messages. I was like, me? You, you want to get coffee with Yes, let's get coffee. And like, I made so many relationships. I ended up, you know, getting meeting girls that way and getting them fellowships at Hearst and so on. So just, um, you know, timing is weird. And so it doesn't always work out that way. Don't be hard on yourself if it doesn't. But talk to anyone you possibly can who might be like, hey, there's a job opening um, when the time comes. Yes. So you guys maybe don't do it, but you guys would say go. Go. I know so many people who went for informational interviews and left with jobs. One of my really, really close friends, who is the senior beauty editor at Cosmopolitan, was living in Texas, went for an inform she flew from Texas, went to an informational interview, left with a job offer. She had to get a New York apartment on Monday. So do it. And just oh to clarify what that is if you don't know. So if you Basically, if you think you might want to do this career path, 
you, you would talk to Carol Ann and I, you would talk to folks in our new College of Arts and Sciences career and internship office. They're amazing. And um, uh, then once you start to get a list of, say, internships that sound interesting to you, using sites like bookjobs.com, then you start to get a sense of companies who actually sound cool, or they kind of sound like they're up your alley, right? You save that in a notebook, right? Then you find those people on Twitter. If one of those people seems really cool on Twitter, then all you do is find their email and say, can I take you out to coffee and ask you about your job? That's an informational interview where you ask for it. And it's amazing how that's really, it's a chance to learn stuff about the industry, this person's job, but it's also a chance for you to ask really smart questions. And I remember talking with each of you at different points, except Colin, because Colin's already, he knows all this stuff, but thinking about our, the interview as being a chance, even if it's information in an interview where you start the process, being a chance for you to ask the smartest possible questions based on everything you learn working at Dogwood, working at the Mirror, work, le learning in world of publishing, so that they know that you can hit the ground running because you know what the job is about. I mean, yeah, like informational interviews, well, we do, we get a lot of those and a lot of them get jobs. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's just the, so, you know, when you apply, you put your, your stuff in cover letters and resumes and it all blurs together. Um, but informational interviews, it's a time to show your personality for sure. It's a time to ask the right questions, like, um, showing that interest, like there's this one question that I had from um, this girl who later didn't get a job at, um, at Simon Schuster, but Harper Collins. But one of the questions that she asked was first, um, what's your impression of the imprint that you work at, the division that you work at? What's your boss's opinion? And then what's the vision that you're told to, to kind of um, contribute? And that was just a smart question because it was thinking big, it was thinking like little but also big at the same time. Um, if you are like struggling with the questions that you should ask for informational interviews, I think Fairfield, there's an internship um, program is still active and career center and um, I think the questions that you form there could really, could really leave an impression with the person you're interviewing. And again, like it's, there's nothing if you can find the contact information, you can you can literally that's that's your point. You know, you can go for it. There's no judging, I think, in publishing or journalism. Okay, so it is, I hired people at my old job, I hire people now, I have a team of 10. It is so hard to find talented, amazing people. All of you are here. I'm I'm you're all at Fairfield, you're all here right now. I already know that you, you know, wanted to go the next step. You already want to go above and beyond. Show that to the people who matter, show that to the person who's hiring, because it is, I would go through dozens and dozens and dozens of cover letters, resumes, everyone was saying the same thing, typos, this, that, and it was, it was like, I don't understand, like how are we, how are we not finding these people? Like we're the unicorns, we're the you know, magical people who, who can do everything and they're rare and finding them is hard. And so when you do, you're like, I don't know if I can hire you, but I'm, I know someone who's looking for someone amazing, so give me your information, I'm passing it on. Because it, I know it sounds crazy because you're everyone's like, it's such a competitive industry, it is you know, so hard. It is, but if you're good and if you want to be good, you can do it. And so I, I can't trust that enough that it is so surprising and it was something that I'm still like, how is it so hard to find talented people? It is, because people just will apply to apply and so yeah, just remember that. I think that's really important. That's awesome. That's you a have, great. You response. have five people here already, yeah. that you can literally. And then you have a bunch of other people that yeah. in the network. So. In the network. So. <laughs> yeah. All well, right. So. We'll, oh, go ahead. We'll, we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll let you chat individually. Yeah. Hi. So um, I actually just graduated from the MFA program this summer. Um, so coming from someone who, unfortunately had to work full time, raise children, couldn't do these side programs like working on magazines, newspapers to get that experience, but loves books, loves to write, would love to be in the industry. What kind of advice would you give when your resume is completely backwards to what you want to do? I work in finance, that's what I do right now, and that's my background, but I want to leave that industry and work in publishing. 
So I would say first, make a list of your favorite authors, and then look to see if there are so many events in the publishing world that are constant. So if you make a list of your favorite authors, you go to their actual like launch events, you see their agents, you meet their fans, all of a sudden you notice that like, there's not a lot of people that go to those. There's like 20 people, and if you can make those connections, then that's one event where like, if you get one person's card and reach out to them, they could connect you to five other people. Mm -hmm. And if you keep going to those types of things, if you keep, you know, again, like looking at Publishers Weekly and Publishers Marketplace and seeing like what's going on, who are the, the key industry people that if I know it can make all the difference and reach out to them, it really does make a world of difference. Um, and again, it's about informational interviews. If you then reach out to them and say like, I just want to pick your brain, like where did you start? Like personally, like I didn't go exactly the conventional route. I know my boss, Barry Cunningham, he started like, somewhere completely different. He was on the marketing side of things um, in music, and he was just like, oh, I want to write a book, and I wear a fedora, so it should be easy. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it, it totally can happen if you just show your eagerness. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if anyone else is. I just add um, that, uh, yes, I think there are very, uh, what we would call unconventional approaches into, I mean, yes, a lot of us work in our school newspapers, and then did this and did that. Um, but, um, you know, one thing I always remind people is that publishing is kind of its own little ecosystem, right? Uh, my, my first graduate degree was actually in a program called Publishing at NYU. I wouldn't do it again. I'm still paying for it. But um, it did help in some ways because, you know, I think it helped me understand that publishing is not just starting as an editorial assistant and moving your, your way up. Uh, for example, um, uh, publishers, large and small, need to figure out their finances. And maybe that's, you know, sometimes a lot of the things uh, that we're talking about is, is just finding a way in. And um, having a financial background makes you very valuable to a publishing company because you can work in finance at a publishing company and then be closer to um, maybe what, what you want to do. In fact, um, when I was at Disney, one of the things that, you know, we, we, you have to work as in, in the editorial department. You have to work very closely with the finance department because, um, you know, they're behind you not to lose too much money. And, you know, one of the women uh, um, who was um, a financial analyst there said that, you know, she, she's a numbers person. That's what she did in, in, in college and everything. But she loved working at a book publishing company because she also got to read books for her job. She had to, she didn't have to, but she, I mean, she ended up reading a lot of the manuscripts that, um, that needed her approval for, um, you know, for uh, acquisition. So, you know, there, there's a way in. Um, um, and sometimes I would say that, especially if you don't have the conventional background, you may find yourself um, perhaps um, more desirable. You know, there's a lot of us who majored in English and, um, you know, did the school paper and that, you know, like, and there are ways to obviously stand out as with that background, you know, um, um, meeting somebody face to face goes a long, long way. We're just human, right? So, you know, there's a stack of resumes, but I met this person last week and they seem fine. So, you know, so, um, there, you know, there's, it's actually that simple. Um, so I also had a friend, um, a classmate in college, who uh, was a math major, and he did the kind of math that I, I can't even describe. It's like theoretical math, right? Um, and went into, I think, yeah, he was working at a credit card co company for a while and you know, did that, and kind of, I think, was feeling a similar way. He ended up uh, becoming a book editor of math textbooks. You know, he worked for Pier I know, you kind of, but by the way, like, he, he worked for Pearson, which is um, a very good company to work for. Um, he still does it. He adores his job. Um, and, you know, based on my own experience as somebody who is not at all thinking about working in children's books, I have to, one of the pieces of advice I would share is that you should be open to something unexpected. Um, you know, I loved working in children's books. It's one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I did not g graduate from college thinking I, I wanted to do it. I you know, didn't ha I'd never thought about it. So, you know, yes, um, you know, you, it may not be something that is obvious, but um, be open to the unexpe unexpected because, you know, who knows? Okay, we'll take one more question and then we can chat individually. Anyone ask? Okay, I'll ask one question. So often, the first step for a lot of folks is an internship. So how do you actually get in the door when, it, it, when you're at that stage of the process? Any advice there? 
especially because they're so competitive and what you have is a piece of paper, right, to offer? Apply you go. everywhere, literally apply if, if you can with, with internships because it is everyone is competing for it. It's really competitive. Um, I guess this, is just, this doesn't really answer the question, but I would say, you know, do something to learn what you want to do with your life. So my first internship, I hated so much, similar to what Colin was saying about realizing he didn't want to be you know, a lawyer, didn't want to go that path. Do something that you think you can learn valuable skills at. Um, and if you hate it, great. Now you know you never want to do that again, and you won't waste your time applying to a bunch of jobs. So I think that on the way to finding what you love, you have to find what you hate. And so great, do it. So I think apply everywhere, see what you can get, and um, you know, see what ends up offering you skills that you can at least take with you. The internship I hated was in fashion. Um, I learned a lot of amazing people skills. I learned a lot of really great you know, techniques and other random things there that I brought with me, but I knew it wasn't that. So I would say, again, I don't know if I'm totally answering the question, but apply to all of the things, and yeah. I don't know. And I think also like most publishers have summer internships. Um, so whether or not you like just dry, like cold apply to those things, but also see if like, okay, I'm interested in working at Abrams over the summer. Go on LinkedIn, see who you even know. I've gone through third degree connections on LinkedIn to say like, all right, so I'm not directly re related to Dave, but I'm directly related to John and I'll have him reach out to Dave for me. Like just get there any way you possibly can. Um, and I actually did get an internship at a textbook company hated it. St you could still have an internship that you hated or that you hate, um, but it could still lead you to something that you you really, really like. Um, and it still is something that like together with my combined experience just with creative writing, that's what eventually did stick out on my resume and got me the job. Okay. <laughs> um, I also would really say don't limit yourself. So one mistake that I made uh, junior and senior year was I was only looking for publishing internships. I really wasn't looking anywhere else because all I wanted to do was book publishing. But look at industries or just think about things that you like doing or that get you excited or even that you're just curious about and really just apply anywhere and everywhere. Apply for internships that you might think, I don't think I would ever want to do that, but I'm kind of curious about it. So let me just go for it. Um, so that's kind of my first recommendation. And the other thing too is I think a cover letter is really important and very powerful. Um, so when I applied for my internship at Cosmo, I didn't have really any direct connections there. And it's such a big company that I thought I had no shot of getting an internship there. But I spent an entire day working on my cover letter, like really looking at the language that they use on their website, like looking at the different things that they were publishing about. And after that, I really took the time to craft a cover letter to show, A, I know what you're talking about, B, I'm excited about what you're doing, and C, I wanna help you grow with my skills. And even now, I think that's probably one of the best cover letters I've ever written. Um, <laughs> I still refer to it sometimes, um, but I think if there's, like an organization or something that you're super passionate about, don't be afraid to let that passion shine. I think it really can go a long way. Yeah, I mean, you also have to remember that on the other side of the cover letter, there's a human out there, close to human, um, depending on what they do. But like, it's just, um, they like to be, I feel like their efforts, they like to be recognized for what they do. So in your cover letter, like, this is like for book publishing, but like don't just say, I've always wanted to edit, I've always loved reading, but there's this one, it was kind of funny, but um, there was this one letter that, that talked about Girl on the Train, and when it came out, there was this uh, neat thing that marketing did, um, not Simon & Schuster, but there was this neat thing where they had taken the books out and then had people, girls, like sitting on a subway seat reading the, the actual uh, cover, or uh, I'm reading the actual book as a marketing scheme, and this person actually mentioned it in the cover letter and said, I loved what you did with this book, it was wrong. But just the fact that it was like, the recognizing what they did, that you spotted this, like, it just goes a long way, because you're paying attention, you're, you're recognizing that they, they did something that impacted you, so, um, but yeah, cover letter's important. All right, so, um, I just want to thank you all so much. I'm so proud of all of you that it makes me want to cry. Yay. 
Um, thank you all for coming. I'll close this part, and you can feel free to mob these fine humans for more individual uh, advice and business cards. Thank you all so much. Thank you.